my presentation's um, usually 20, 25 minutes. I'll try to get through as quick as I can. I know everybody's anxious to go home. Um, this is about work zone safety. Um, I'll go through all these slides. Uh, I have a lot of uh, action on my uh, presentation. Uh, we start with a work zone, a simple work zone of an exit gore sign. And on that exit gore sign, uh, there are several options that you can choose when you implement traffic control measures for working on that sign. If you apply the TxDOT standards, um, you can protect the work zone in the gore with your work truck, uh, cones, and advanced warning signs. You could go to the extreme of closing the actual ramp, or you can close the outside lane. Uh, in our district, unfortunately, we had a, uh, a fatality of one of our employees who did exactly that. They, they opted with number one, which is something that everybody uses all the time. It's safe. Um, and an, an idiot basically came across four lanes of traffic and uh, clipped around one of our vehicles and uh, killed one of our employees. So this is a sign of, uh, of, of that event and our workers there at the site. So what else could we do? So we start talking about implementing enhanced traffic control measures. And so in that case, what we talk about is doing all three. We would protect the work zone, we would close the ramp, and we would close the outside lane. So there we're doing all three. Um, this changes our priorities from inconvenience of the traveling public to worker and public safety. Before, we would try not to close the ramp for inconvenience of the traveling public, and now, because of some of these events and some of the increased traffic, we start talking about worker and public safety takes a priority. Um, we start with personal safety. We have yellow hard hat programs for, uh, for people that are new out on the work site to kind of have the old hands keep an eye out for those people. Our regular eye and hearing protection. We have reflective vests. We went from an orange to a uh, yellow, and then now we're, we have some shirts that are in the, in the way. If you don't have shirts, you need to try to order them. I understand they're still in production. Um, then we have safety gloves, steel toe boots, and then try to illuminate the flagger devices wherever you do have a flagger. Um, one of the best things to protect the actual worker when they're out on the work site is trunk mounted attenuators. And these are just a couple different varieties of those and they get a little bit fancier with uh, changeable message boards and things. Um, so anytime you have boots on the ground, what they call boots on the ground, um, you, you need to use uh, the standards, and there's a lot of things in the standards that give you options. And what I say to that is if they're calling for a TMA and it's an optional TMA, then in our district we do not let that be optional. We use the TMA. I do not understand why we would have that as an option. Uh, other things you can do is you can protect all activities where employees are outside the vehicle, whether it be picking up trash or uh, anything, uh, on, anything on the roadside that somebody might get struck. And then you try to provide a buffer lane to the work activities where possible. So let me give you an example of what not to do. So this was, this was a, uh, an actual event uh, that happened in our district. Uh, I happened to be driving down the road with one of my contractors. Uh, I've known this contractor for 15 years. I've never been in his vehicle, but it, we, I was having a bet with him. And so he got upset with me and got me in his vehicle, and we started driving down the interstate. As we're driving down the interstate, I see this fellow on the inside median by a sign. Then you notice, if you look at the picture even more, you'll see a work truck on the outside shoulder, which is probably the supervisor sitting in that truck, waiting for his person to cross the freeway. Now, those of you who think that El Paso doesn't have a lot of traffic, I don't know that I would want to cross that five lanes of traffic, and those, tr those vehicles are going 60 miles an hour at least. Um, but it seems to be pretty common. Uh, pretty commonplace. Uh, it doesn't seem like anybody's really concerned. Uh, we were able to catch this on our Transvista system, which is uh, basically our, our eyes and ears for uh, traffic incident management. And uh, you can see the person is uh, there on the, on the median and um, kind of trying to find a spot to get across. And uh, he sees that he can't get a spot to get across, so he goes out a little bit. Maybe I can get across right there. And then uh, you'll see him go back onto the median, uh, kind of resting, just waiting for, I guess, some assistance. Um, eventually, he'll get across. And you have to wonder, what in the world is this guy doing? Um, what kind, this is not a TxDOT employee. This is one of our contractors. Uh, this is actually a subcontractor. Um, this, well, it's a guardrail contractor uh, doing their own traffic control. And uh, of course, this person was terminated. 
uh, by their company once this was given. So here he is, he thinks like now that's a safe gap, and there he goes. As he's going across, he realizes, oh my gosh, um, I might get hit, and there he goes. Well, it's not the only time something like that happens. Uh, this will close here shortly. Uh, we'll start with another one. Well, this is a different area, a lot lighter traffic, and you see two people now coming with the sign. Uh, why in the world would you have two people? I have no idea, but there they go. Well, that's a walk in the park compared to the other one. Uh, but there they go, like it's a natural, normal activity. Rather than taking the vehicle and going around and dropping off in the median so the truck can at least protect you, uh, that seems to be a normal activity. And those are only two that we caught. Now, this same truck goes down the road, and he thinks it's safe to park in the gore. Uh, we already talked about how dangerous a gore can be. And they get out complacent. Uh, they're working in the, they're getting their uh, signs and their stands. Um, not knowing, I guess, or not realizing that you've got high-speed traffic on both sides of your vehicle with no protection. So one person stays in the, in the gore where they place a sign, and the other person, guess what? There he goes. So that's what happened with the other person, you know, uh, earlier. They have the stand and the sign. What kind of bad things can happen there? Um, so there they go, and it, it's amazing. He's sitting in the median uh, like nothing. Right there, it just takes a blink of an eye for somebody to clip him on the shoulder, he's dead. He'll stand there in the lane like it's a city street because he can't wait 12 feet to get across. And he runs across to the vehicle. They talk for a second, they get in the vehicle. Well, then they go to the next activity, and the next activity is, of course, setting up their barrels. Well, what I'll submit to you there is, look at where they are in relation to the traffic. They're behind the truck. Um, setting up barrels. They're not paying attention to any of the traffic that's going by. Uh, this is an interstate highway. Uh, for those that don't know, El Paso is a main east to west corridor. This is the interstate to California and back. Um, boy, I, I would be paying attention um, all the time. But anyway, uh, they set the barrels. Eventually, the, the person put up the arrow board and then he'll get in the truck. The other poor soul will be outside trying to put up all the barrels. Um, and it's just amazing to me the amount of traffic that passes by this operation. So just let that play out for a few minutes so you can see that. And you have to ask yourself, what's wrong with that picture? You know, make a list of what's wrong with that picture. It's amazing when you talk to some of these people after they do something like this, they have a lot of excuses. Uh, I heard earlier you asked somebody uh, five times why. Uh, I don't think it takes five times to ask somebody why. That's stupid. Um, but here they go. So now this guy's protected. Um, so I don't know, he could have been run over there. And then uh, conveniently he has like a little seat there on the truck so he can jump in and out of the truck so he doesn't get tired walking up and down the road. Um, but he's oblivious to the traffic. There's no attenuator, there's no protection, there's no police officers, there's nothing to protect this guy from getting killed. And he is the advanced warning for our work zone. So. So moving along, um, so what we talk about is having traffic control hierarchy. Uh, the first thing you want to do is you want to try to reduce the exposure to traffic. And then when you do have uh, exposure to traffic, you want to try and enhance that, any of the traffic control devices that you might use. So far, first of all, trying to reduce the traffic. You try to combine things when you have a closure, try to do anything that you can within that closure. Um, when you have emergencies, you don't do any repairs to the operation. You try to just remove uh, the sign or whatever might be on the roadway and then do plan that later. And then you try to develop a traffic control plan aimed at removing live traffic from the work zone. A couple of examples of that. Uh, we have a project in El Paso that fortunately builds the, the basically the main part of the road inside the median. So there you just totally close off the traffic. Uh, from the work zone. You can see the intersections totally closed off, no access allowed to the project, yet you still provide um, access to the businesses and you provide uh, local access only signage to the businesses. Um, we have a safety review committee in our district. Um, there's some times where you want to modify a traffic control plan. You go out to the field and there's something that you might want to modify. Uh, this tra the safety review committee helps review the safety aspects of that, of that uh, change approving uh, operational improvements that you might have, 
and then they provide implementation concurrence from a liability standpoint, if nothing else. Here's an example of, a, of a, basically an overlay project. Um, basically, a state standard applied. Um, this is a typical one-lane closure. You have work right up against the barrels and workers right on the other side of the barrels. Some people think that's safe. In this case, we were able to utilize our frontage road. So this is the revised set of plans where we actually detour the traffic to the frontage roads. That totally eliminates the issue where you have live traffic right against um, workers. Of course, everybody's seen this where we have CTB protection. Normally, the plans would have like a barrel, uh, barrel protection there. But for the workers and the traveling public, uh, the CTB was warranted in this, uh, this uh, situation. You try to work um, above traffic and not implement um, closures where you can. So here you are here using aerial devices to do that, where you have to get out onto the main lanes. Um, you'd close the lanes down to one lane. You'll have multiple lane closures, and you'll keep the traffic open to one lane. Uh, this is, of course, at night. And then you have, you can see you have your uh, truck-mounted attenuators uh, on the outside lane, and then you have an extra one creating a buffer to the work zone. Other things, you'll have aerial devices where you, this is a drilling operation where you're putting in a fence, uh, and you're worried about things falling down onto traffic, does not really warrant a full closure. So you have, you create devices to collect anything that might uh, fall from that operation down onto traffic. Therefore, you can use do that operation 24-7. Uh, uh, typical bridge work, um, of course, you use a kickboard and then some plywood. Uh, again, that allows you to do a lot of work without even disrupting, disrupting traffic below. Uh, then when you do have to have um, where you are close to traffic, you try to enhance your traffic control. So what I say is you apply your standards as a minimum. You start there. And what other things can you try to do? Well, first, you need to recognize that speed kills. So you need to get people to slow down. Uh, first thing you do is you have speed reductions. We all know about advisory and, and uh, um, the give us a break signs, the advisory speeds, speed reductions, traffic uh, fines double. Um, we also have speed trailers. Heard about that already. Everybody's pretty familiar with that. Those are very effective and they have a lot of different flashing lights and things that make that even more effective. And then, of course, the most effective part is law enforcement assistance. But you need to strategically place the patrol vehicles. You need to visit the stations throughout the closure duration. And you need to require that the officer be outside the vehicle where it's applicable. In some cases, you don't want them out of the vehicle. In other cases, you do. Um, it just depends. So here's, an, here's a closure on our interstate. You can see everybody's already in the outside lane. You have police officers in place in case there's some errant vehicle that might get through. Um, also, police can help you on manual signal operation. You can see the queue coming from the detour on the interstate closure, and then you have the police officer manually um, assisting on the traffic uh, green time. Where you don't have a traffic signal in place, you might want to use portable signals. They also have cameras with them that you can uh, monitor from, a, from an office. Uh, of course, the changeable message signs, or if you have permanent message boards, uh, those are also helpful. Of course, we talked a lot about portal rumble strips already. That is a requirement in the state standards now. Um, so we'll be using that a lot more. And then we talk about the moving operation definition. And on the moving operation definition, everybody talks about a 15-minute allowance for uh, basically a static operation. Um, what I say to that is try to get away from that as much as possible and try to use um, different innovations. In this case, I talk about the mobile barrier trailer to try to use that where that's available. So here's a picture of that. Uh, you can see live traffic on one side of the trailer, people working on standard pothole repairs. That would not, in my opinion, be a 15-minute operation unless you're just throwing in some cold mix that you're going to have to come back and repair anyway later. Um, and so that I don't, I don't want to be out there for 15 minutes. Uh, that has, there's no magic to 15 minutes. If you get killed in minute number seven, I don't know what that really did. Um, here's some more pictures of that mobile barrier. Um, it's a pretty long, uh, it's a pretty long um, barrier. It's made out of steel. This is it being used, uh, I believe, in the Fort Worth district. Uh, you can see they have the uh, scorpion attenuators in advance of the work zone. Uh, you can see that on the right-hand side there. Here's another view. You can see traffic on the left-hand side of the, of the device with your uh, scorpion uh, TMA. And then let me show you kind of what it, what it looks like. Oops. Let me 
just show you kind of a little bit now, of how that works. Live. This is NBC5 News. Distracted drivers can turn construction zones into deadly crash zones. Across the country, 720 workers were killed along the roads in 2008, 134 of them here in Texas. But now a new barrier being tested in North Texas could keep workers and drivers safe. Here's NBC5's Julie Tan. Road construction is dangerous work especially on an interstate with cars whizzing by. For some reason, people just don't pay attention to it. These TxDOT workers say they see drivers losing control in construction zones every week. I've run and, and had to get out of the way. Supervisor John Perpura says he won't have to if TxDOT buys this mobile barrier trailer that workers are testing on I-30. The steel barrier is meant to protect workers from cars that veer toward them. The crash tests are remarkable. When a pickup truck going 60 miles an hour hits the mobile barrier, the damage is not nearly as crippling as hitting concrete. And no damage to the barrier. We used to only have cones and, and uh, barrels out here. They'd hit those and hit us. So with something like this, that would cover us. You can see all the marks from where vehicles have hit the concrete barrier. And in fact, in this very work zone, construction workers are repairing an area where an 18-wheeler hit the concrete barrier. We're seeing an increase in productivity because work zones don't have to be put up and pulled down. And if they're doing a mobile work zone, this can completely go right down the road. The North Texas Tollway Authority has two mobile barriers. Each one costs about a quarter of a million dollars. It comes with a message board and speed radar. In Fort Worth, Julie Tam, NBC5. Okay, so that's pretty good. I mean, I've heard about the mobile uh, barrier trailer. And until you kind of see that hit, it's, uh, uh, it's a little bit... Um, okay, there we go. Okay, so then there's some occasions where you might actually have to close the freeway. That's a good thing and a bad thing sometimes, depending. But this is a picture of our interstate actually closed, and I thought that was an interesting picture. Don't see that often. Um, but here, we'll walk you through a closure. So basically, like in the other slides, you have basically everybody closed down to one outside lane, and you're taking them off the interstate. And as you advance into the traffic control, you see the police officer assistance. And then you see your uh, truck-mounted attenuators. And, and here, what I talk about is including the shoulders. Because uh, what you don't really want to do at that point is, is allow anybody by at all. And the standard sometimes is vague on whether you should do that or not. I would, I would recommend that you close that at that point. And then you go to your conventional type 3 road close um, barrier. Um, and then what we've added to our closures is um, looking at all the access points in the work zone. Uh, basically placing water fill barriers at entrance ramps, which may not be allowed um, on a high-speed facility, but on a low-speed ramp situation that works very effectively and can be moved around. Um, and also to talk about the exit ramps, because there's been some, some occasion where people would get in the wrong direction on the exit ramps, people get desperate and will try to do anything they can to get into the work zone. So I encourage that. And then we talk about in, interior work zone protection. A lot of people say, well, if somebody were to get by all that, then what else can you do? And people will talk about putting concrete traffic barrier at that point because that idiot should probably die instead of kill one of our workers, which has happened. We had a person get through our work zone, kill two people on a, on a crane operation, and you wonder, how did that person get in? Of course, that person's serving 30 years of time, is totally um, intoxicated, but at that point, uh, TxDOT is a forgiving agency trying to look at safety. So I submit to you, instead of placing a concrete barrier as a last defense, I introduced the Dragnet Vehicle Arresting Barrier System. Let me show you what happens on the conventional concrete barrier. So this is beyond the clear zone. It's outside the road, or this would be basically in advance of any static work activity. And look at the damage somebody would have, just a pickup truck hitting the barrier. And then look at what happens to the damage of the vehicle itself. And of course, the, the occupant of the vehicle, which is laying on the ground in front of the vehicle, he of course died. Um, so what I talk about there is, in, in lieu of that, let's talk about a, a more forgiving system. And a forgiving system would be this dragnet. Um, I got these slides from uh, uh, the dragnet company uh, based out of New York. 
Uh, here's a, here is the actual fence placed at our, this is the University of Texas at El Paso, uh, Bhutanese architecture, by the way. And um, the, there's the fence. It looks just like a chain link fence. It's about four feet tall. You lay it across the roadway. Here's a couple shots of the fence, different angles, different geometry. It attaches to your guardrail or your CTB, or in this case, you can attach it into the ground on your hot mix or concrete pavement uh, with a foundation. And then it has a spring device with a steel tape that's inside the, um, it's a spool of tape, that that's what, it, uh, that's what will actually be relieved as the fence is being hit and it'll absorb the energy and slow down the vehicle. So let me show you how that works. Introducing the Dragnet Vehicle Arresting System. This new type of impact attenuator was designed to safely catch and contain out of control or misplaced vehicles. What you are viewing is a test in conjunction with the New York State Department of Transportation. It shows a 4,000 pound vehicle traveling at a speed of 62 miles per hour at the moment of impact. The car is stopped in a distance of 54 feet with an average force of 2 G's, which falls far below the FHWA criteria set up in NCHRP 230. This test was conducted with a live driver who did not apply the brakes during deceleration. The dragnet consists of two energy absorbers linked together by a four foot high fence. The fence acts like a net to catch the car, no matter what angle or part of the net is struck. Inside each energy absorber is a spool of metal tape. The tape is led through a number of staggered pins. As the net is hit, the metal tape is pulled through the pins, constantly bending and straightening the tape. The friction created causes the smooth, safe deceleration of the vehicle. By changing the gauge of the metal tape and configuration of the pins, we can design a barrier to handle almost any situation, from an 1,800-pound car to an 80,000-pound tractor trailer. The New York State Department of Transportation was concerned with safety at the construction sites. On a night paving job on the Long Island Expressway, this device was placed across the three lanes and all entrance ramps. During the three-month life of the job, the net was struck 11 times. Each hit resulted in safely stopping the vehicle with no injury to the driver or construction personnel. Since then, the New York State Department of Transportation has used a total of 30 dragnets on similar jobs on Long Island with equal success. The only requirement to restore the dragnet to 100% efficiency is to replace the spool of metal tape in the energy absorbers. On this expressway installation, the dragnet was anchored by using a sleeve system. A sleeve was placed in a three-foot cube of concrete. The energy absorber slides in and out of the sleeves easily, resulting in short setup and dismantle times. After every hit, the vehicle was sound enough to drive away. As the videotape demonstrates, damage to the vehicle was very minor. Okay, so that's, uh, that's one of the solutions. Rather than using concrete barrier that's unforgiving, that system we're now using in El Paso anytime we do an interstate closure. And oh, by the way, it's very reusable. So once you engineer the, the right dimensions for it, you maintain the fence, you keep it in your maintenance yard, and anytime you go out there, your anchor system is already in place. So it becomes more cost effective as time goes on. A couple other applications of that is where you might have a, a median, where you might want to protect, a, basically you have guardrail there a lot of times, where you might want to protect that area. Uh, you can see here your foundation is in the concrete and it's set up for anybody that might run off the road and get in behind your guardrail protecting the approach. Um, so let me kind of show you how that works.
An additional test was recently performed in conjunction with the Oklahoma Department of Transportation. They had a problem with the median opening between parallel highways. They were concerned with the ability of the dragnet to perform on unpaved surfaces and whether the dragnet was able to conform to the contour of median slopes. As you can see, the vehicle has come to a complete stop, despite the driver continuing to accelerate through the barrier. Uh, and that person was actually a race car driver that came uh, to try to run that test to see if he could get out of the net. Another application of this would be in your truck escape ramps. Um, basically, you can see here is a truck going through. A, it's a series of, of these fences. You can see him going through that. You can see the amount of spool of, of basically tape that's used. Uh, and let me show you a live application of that. By using a series of six nets, the drag net can also be used on truck emergency runoff ramps. By applying this design, you can contain and decelerate a tractor trailer weighing 80,000 pounds and moving at 60 miles per hour within 316 feet. The result is a deceleration force of 0.52 G's, which will greatly minimize jackknifing or load shift. This application of the dragnet eliminates the problem of freezing gravel beds and truck removal after impact. This device has been used at ferry slips to secure the open roadway after the ferry has left. It has also been used at the end of drag strips to protect the drivers in the event of brake failure. So a few different applications. Um, let's find get this in the video. Just to give an, a few other ideas for the dragnet, other applications at T intersections, uh, other road closures, railroad crossings, uh, and it also has a bi-directional use, meaning it can be hit by both sides and still be fully effective. Short video on this. T intersections that have, up to now, been protected by guardrails can be transformed to a safe and positive stop. Temporary road closures, often guarded by 10-foot sections of concrete barrier, can be upgraded from a dangerous hazard to a forgiving deceleration. Railroad crossings that have been the scene of many fatalities across the country can also be protected safely with the dragnet. This is a rendering of the Lock Street Bridge in upstate New York. The dragnet was placed on a structure that raises and lowers the net as the bridge opens and closes, thus safely preventing any vehicle from entering the open bridge deck. Due to the unique design of the dragnet, this system can be utilized in a bi-directional application. No matter which side of the net is struck, the energy absorber will function at 100% efficiency. This application is well suited for road closures, such as commuter lanes and some construction sites where traffic must be rerouted. Okay, so in conclusion, um, what I advise everybody to be is be safe and be alert. And, and you need to be alert as if your life really depended on it and the life of the people that are around you uh, uh, depend on that. Uh, and this presentation is in memory of the, the employee that we lost. His name is Cito Lozano. Uh, here he's pictured here. Uh, we lost him back in June of 13. Um, so this is in honor of him. And with that, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, and I thank you very much.